Hello and welcome to one of the first Motley Writers Guild interviews with one of our members. I'm M. Van Moore. I'm a writer and one of the founding members of the Motley Writers Guild. And I have with me here today, Dylan West, who is another member of the Motley Writers Guild. Hi, Dylan. Hi, how are you? Thanks I'm for good. Having me. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Well, besides for the fact that I found out I had COVID as of yesterday, but, you know, I'm feeling good now. Oh, good. Okay. I hope you're on the mend. <laughs> yep. Um, and uh, and you're a relatively recent member of the Guild as of this year, right? That's right. Okay, awesome. But you are already a pretty successful author, aren't you? Well, I guess as far as um, self-published authors go. <laughs> yes, we consider those authors still. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, in terms of sales numbers for a, a self-published versus the typical sales numbers for a trad author yes. for you know the first year and a half. Yes. And um and what numbers are those exactly? Okay. Well, um about 1600 total sales across the three books. Um the the first book in the Scribe series called Scribe's Descent. Um I sold my thousandth copy of that over Halloween. So that was a big milestone. It took me about a year and a half to get there, um which was 6 months earlier than my um, original goal. I wanted to get that number in two years. I got it in a year and a half. So that's, okay. that's good. But you're and then, um, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> and then the related novella called Emulsipation. Um, hopefully you can see that. I can, um, yeah. That one I've sold pretty close to 500 copies in its first year of publication. And then I just released the sequel to Scribe's Descent called Scribe's Aflame. That was back in September, and I've already sold about 70, 80 copies of that. Okay. So it's not too and, bad. Um, and those, that's your, your, is that your debut series, the, the Scribe series? That's right. Okay. And, um, and what is your, uh, what is your history as a writer? Like what inspired you to write this? And, and uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. Well, the first thing you should know is that I used to hate reading and writing. Oh. I used to think reading was boring. Now, okay. granted, I was, that was the first 13 years of my life. Okay. And if you think about what I had to do with writing and reading, it was all school, teachers holding, you know, the GPA gun to my head and saying, you better read and write because your grade depends on it, pal, right? <laughs> It was work. And that's it was not fun. And that's not fun. No. You know, I mean, I love learning, but I didn't want some teacher telling me you have to read, you know, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Yeah. You know, some four or 500 page literature, you know, yeah. that I don't really care about, anything. you know, the topic. Right. So I kind of felt like reading was just a chore until I went to a scholastic book fair. <gasps> Yep. I brought my hard earned money. I think I, I had like a $10 bill I earned from my, my grandma who lived next door. Um, maybe swindled is a better word for it because like I would, would charge her way too much money to sweep the leaves off of her, her front porch. But anyways, I think that was some of that money I brought to that book fair and I swept the entire floor looking for something that looked fun because I heard rumors that there were books that were actually fun. I was like, all right, we're going to see. I'm going to. Yeah, gonna you got to test that that, those rumors, right? <laughs> you know, by, by the time I was 13 years old, I, I was in the eighth grade. I was like, all right, I have friends who love reading. I'm going to see what this whole fuss is about. So I found a book called Salamandastron by Brian Jacques. And for those of you who aren't familiar, that is one of the Redwall series books. It's oh. got talking animals, right? Like the mice yeah. are the good creatures and the rats and the weasels and stoats are the bad ones. Yeah. And the bad ones try to enslave the good ones, right? You know, that kind of thing. So I, I bought that book with my own money. It was the first time I'd ever done that. And I sat down to just start reading that book. And right there in that hall, I tried the first few pages and I thought this is actually really imaginative yeah it wasn't stuffy literature it was like it wasn't great expectations badgers and yeah 
<laughs> I thought, all right, this is this is really cool. Yeah. Um, and then when I finished it, I became a reader and a writer kind of overnight. Oh my goodness. And I'll tell you what I did. I took a stack of 400 college ruled loose leaf notebook paper and number two pencil cloistered myself in my tiny little bedroom. And I wrote a, a 400 page novel in about two or three weeks. Wow. As an, eight, an, an eighth grader. And my parents didn't even know about this until I, I think after I graduated and oh, wow. I just brought it up in conversation. Oh yeah. And the novel that I wrote and my parents just, Look to me. What novel? What? You wrote a novel? Oh, I didn't tell you. <laughs> it was called Palmdale, and it was a shameless ripoff of the Redwall series. In fact, oh yeah. You know, if you're familiar with the Redwall books, you know how it has those cute little animal pictures that at the, the top of every chapter no, well I even drew those my own versions of those at the top of all my chapters oh uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay so, we're inspired now you know I, I can't remember you know too much about the book um as far as well was it good quality probably not um but it was 400 pages and it yeah. took me from a non-writer to a writer very quickly. In eighth grade, after not picking yeah, up a book. Yeah, I was 13, 13 years old. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's a wonderful origin story, Dylan. I love that. Yeah, uh, origin story. I didn't get, um, you know, bit by a spider or fall into radioactive mm. goo. But, you know. No, is, or like, you know, like a cursed close. book didn't enchant you or something. <laughs> you just found something that really spoke to you and it just resonated and it inspired you. Oh, and in fact, you one could argue that my book, Emulsipation, takes a lot of um, inspiration from the Redwall series. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on with my with my story, guys. Yeah, I don't see your video, but I still see me. Can you? Or now you're back. I'm back. I'm not sure what's going on with mine. Um, okay. Yeah, I was wondering if Emulsipation was um, was a little bit inspired by that because some of the characters in it are. Yeah, we're talking animals. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was the term that we use. Well, uh, this one has a gondola mole, which is different from our ones on Earth. But anyways. Okay. That's okay. And then um, you are, um, you have a background in, in technology, right? IT? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I started off in the Navy as a nuclear operator. So running um, an electric plant for the, the USS Carl Vinson, which is an aircraft carrier. So I learned a lot of science and engineering from, from that. Yeah. Then I uh, got my degree in internet programming, got out of the Navy, started building web applications, and then got another four-year degree in game and simulation programming, and then I started making games. Okay. Which is going to tie into something I'll show you related to my books in a little bit. Okay. I like that. That's very exciting. Um, so then in total, um, how many books have you written overall? I think the total comes to nine so far, but of those nine, two will probably never see the light of publication. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, we all have those dumpster fires that <laughs> shall not shall not be revived. <laughs> but um, the third book that I drafted was Scribe's Descent, and that was the okay. first one that I published. Um, the others that I've written are, I, I took the whole five book series of, of the Scribes and I wrote it all over a 12 year period before I published book one. Okay. Because I, I wanted to know the end from the beginning. Um, one second, we just have to take one moment of a break, sorry. And we're back, okay. So we were discussing um, Scribe's Descent and how that was your third book written, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. But first book published. That's right. So you already held them up earlier, and you you gave you know our viewers a little little preview. Um, those are the three books in total that you have got published. That's right. Okay, so it started with Scribes Descent in um, April 2020. Is that right? That sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to hold it up and show our viewers? Well, not 2020. 2022. 2022. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah. that's the first that's right. in a five book series. That's right. And the whole five books are already written. Yes. 
Great. Okay. He's revising and book three right now okay. to release in. Ninety percent of writing is revising anyway. Oh, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then um and then most recently, uh, the second in the series was released, right? Yep. Scribes of Flame. Flame. All right. Yeah. That looks amazing. I love the cover art for this series, oh, by the way. Thanks. I think it's just beautiful. So do you want to tell me and the viewers and potential readers or already readers, you're may, you maybe go already um, 1,600 people's new favorite author, who knows, right? Um, do you want to tell us about the Scribe series and a little bit about the world building? Okay. Well, I think the, the easiest thing, the best thing to do is just for me to read the back description of book one. Absolutely. Right, so um, people worship technology on planet Daishan. With inventions that prolong life and eradicate disease, it's little wonder. Death seems obsolete until an earthquake kills thousands, including Mallory's parents. They should have lived for a thousand years, not just 50. Mallory scrambles for answers. Such a disaster shouldn't be possible. Quakes have never happened on this world before. Suspecting the top research center had triggered it, her best friend's father investigates. When he turns up missing, Mallory goes on site after him as a geology intern. She can't bear to lose anyone else. An old mine sits at the epicenter of the recent quake, and an unbreakable alien barrier seals it off. But a door, hidden in its surface, opens for Mallory when she trans translates its engravings. Once inside, she evades underground predators while cut off from the tech that's always protected her. Some graves run much deeper than six feet, and this place could be one of them. Within this self-contained world lie the remnants of a universal war, revealing that Daishoni folklore is more than superstition. To survive, Mallory must trust in something more than science and logic. She must follow the voice of one she can't see down to the very bottom. Something deadlier than a quake is trapped there, and it is trying to escape. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Sound effects. Yeah. That is gripping. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and that's, that's the first book, right? That's Scribes to Set. Yeah. So the rest of the series, we see um, the, the scribes getting all the way to the bottom of that deep mine shaft. And if you notice on the book cover, it shows a side view, a profile of the, the planet where the white the, is the sky and this white line with oh, yeah. connecting them is like a deep mine shaft. And you've yeah. got this big mountain at the bottom. So book one gets you from here to here. <laughs> book two gets you from here to here. Down, down there. Three, okay. It gets you all the way back up and then some. There's stuff that happens on the surface. And book four and five take place uh, uh, on other planets. Okay. And I, I don't want to say too much more about it because no, no, don't spoil territory. Don't spoil yeah. it too much. We wanna, <laughs> we wanna, yeah. we wanna read it. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and on the first cover, there is a mountain at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And right. then on the second cover of the most recent release, the second in the series, there is a character. Yeah, there's a stony guy on here. I don't want to say too much about him, but you okay. will meet him in book two for sure. In, in Scribes of Flame, right? That's right. Amazing. The Scribes yeah. Descent does have a 4.8 rating on Amazon, um, which is an excellent rating. 88 reviews. So, you know, nice. there's no review bombing going on here. Yeah. Um, it's got really, really good reviews. Um, and you've sold a lot of copies of it, not just online, but you also you also have a, a pretty good hustle in person that I've seen on, on your <laughs> um, on your Twitter account. Do you want to tell us about what you kind of do to get out there and meet your fans and potential readers? Sure. Well, the first thing is I never leave my house without wearing my Scribes Descent t-shirt. I love and it. you notice that I have the poster in the background. I did notice. Uh, Branded <laughs> and, merch. Very smart, Dylan. And when I, when I leave the house, I always have a stack of my books in one hand. And it matches the shirt I'm wearing. So when I go out in town, people look at the shirt. They look at my yeah. book and then they look back at me and they're like, what's going on? Do you really like this book? And I'm like, yeah, you could call me a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I might like it. <laughs> I might like, you know, 500,000 words like it. <laughs> so I, um, I, I've sold copies of this at 30,000 feet on a flight to my daughter's speech and debate tournament. I've sold it in to my hygienist during a teeth cleaning, sold it to my dentist right after I sold it to the hygienist, and then to the lady at checkout. I was going did you get the receptionist? Yeah, yeah. And then I, I've sold it while standing in line for food like twice. Oh my goodness, places. I love that. I sold it at a rest stop on the way back from a tournament. And I sold like 40 something copies at the tournament. Um, so I, I uh, judge homeschool speech and debate. My wife also does that. My Our daughter competes. Oh, and when cool. we go to these tournaments... You know, we, we, I sell lots of these because these are Christian based and at these events there, they tend to be Christian based. And the main character, Mallory, is a homeschooler who was oh. involved in speech and debate. So, okay. in fact, there is some speech and debate in the second half of this book. Interesting. The, the twins who illustrated this cover were homeschooled. My main critique partner for this entire series was homeschooled. Homeschool. The whole <laughs> So you you can't find a more homeschool friendly book series. So what I do the you know when I'm not selling it to the general masses, I'm trying to target to the audience that I you know really feels at home. Yeah, very represented. You know, because like, how many books have you read that starred very prominently a homeschooler? You know, or involved speech think, and debate. Right? I can't think of a single one to be. Honest. I can't. I can't either. So um, yeah. So having that audience lasered in in really yeah, nice help. absolutely i totally agree with that and they always say to write what you know right that's oh, why yeah. i write about anxiety um <laughs> <laughs> you called yourself out there <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the second in the book was released on um september oh um you're talking about drive a flame Oh, oh, no, good. emancipation. No, so, no, you're yeah, right. This one was released in September of last year. Okay. And this is the TV show that Mallory and her friends like to quote from in the main series. So okay. So that describes the flame. Because this takes place in a different universe. Mm -hmm. in, in the scribe verse, that's what I call it, they don't have Star Wars and, you know, all, all the, the shows that we, yeah. we, we know. So... I thought, well, if they're going to be as geeky as I am, they have to have their favorite books and shows and they stuff. They have to have too, their own right? media, yes. So I write that stuff, Good. Which, which means I'm just, you know, when you when you get this, you're not just reading Scribes' Descent. You're also reading parts of Emulsipation, The Sewer Lord, and The Book of Books. I literally had to write three other books just to write this one. Oh, mm -hmm. and I had to write my own Silmarillion. Uh -huh. Which is like a world, a fifty-five thousand world building guide, just to keep all the details in this universe straight. So, oh my goodness gracious! So yeah, the, like the whole um, iceberg theory of world building, yeah. where you have to build a huge infrastructure just to support a little story. Like I, I yeah. took that to heart here. Um, so that that uh, those spiral bound notebooks that you wrote from as a as an eighth grader, um, they would now break uh, a bookshelf if they <laughs> done the same thing for the scribe. Verse, huh? And I took it even farther. I even made a video game. A video game of this. And um, since Zoom is going to kick us off in you know probably fifteen something minutes, I figured maybe we could go ahead and show it off if that's okay. That would be awesome. I would. We would love to see the game that this is all based on. Yes, please. Let me go ahead and share. I will... All right, guys. So. You get to actually see the protagonist in the Scribe series right here. This redhead named Mallory is the star of the book and the game. And you actually even get to see Boxer here, who is another, uh, he's one of the three scribes of the Scribe series. Uh, I'm going to fly through some of this dialogue so I can show you some of the features. You'll notice it is a Metroidvania. For those of you who play video games, you know what that means. That means a big map of that's interconnected where you can find different traversal abilities like double jump and mid-air dashes and wall climbing and all that in order to reach new areas. But what makes this Metroidvania special is it's based on my book um, and 
you can get your name into my game. And I'll show you right here. You see that little page icon? When I collect it, it shows the name of a person at the bottom corner. Yeah, that Dreama. would be somebody, yeah, Dreama. That would be somebody who reviewed one of my books on Amazon. So if you review any of my books, any of these guys, your name will be in here next. And that's the first 500 people. Right now, I've got 13 names in the game, but I've got about 80 names on my list. So I've got room for about 420 more. So Okay, that sounds, that's a really great way to tie in the entire Scribeverse with yeah. your growing readership. That's amazing. Yeah. You get to actually experience the, uh, you get to play the story, not just read it. Okay. Now, and, would, you, would you recommend that people read it first or play first? Do both of the same um, time? Some people worry about spoilers. I'm not really sure that the game would spoil too much for the book, but if you're really worried about it, probably read the book first. Okay. It's not a problem right now because I've only made the first 15 minutes of a demo of the game. I, I still need, I have a lot of work to do before the 60 hour title is done. But okay. if you notice the music changed in the background, that's because I'm coming up on the boss. You want to okay. see a, a boss fight? I do, yeah. <laughs> So here's the Ragna. This guy is in chapter one, uh, chapter nine, sorry, chapter 19 of the book, Scribe's Descent. You get to read about him. Um, you actually see more of him in book two. And right now you'll see I'm jumping up and hitting him in the head because if I touch him in the body, I'll get hurt. And if I hit him in the body, it won't hurt him. So I have to carefully just, oops, I think I got a little too close to him. There's a way to cheese him where I just stand in the corner, jump and slash really fast. And then I could beat him that way. And you you don't ask the creator of it. You don't even cheat at all. You just beat him. <laughs> well, this, uh, you know, tactic of jumping here in the corner is a little bit of a cheat. But oh. um, that's a reward for the player if they can figure out that that works, right? Um, I mean, so you'll see here, like, I've added a lot of details. There's even, like, this little splash animation. I sat down in Adobe Flash, and for so a solid hour, I hand-animated all of those frames to make that water splash look right. I mean, the amount of effort that goes into making a game like this is kind of crazy. I can show you the world map here. If I jump, you'll see the little knife icon jumps. Yeah. That represents where Mallory is. Okay. Um, and right now I can just jump straight up the wall. Oh, that's um, so cool. But uh, and I can also like dash, break walls. And there's the name of another reader who's reviewed your work on Amazon. Yep. That's right. Oh, and I can show you, there's a list of reclaimants here. So I've collected these four names. And eventually um, when all 500 people are in the game, I can scroll down and see them all here. Oh, that's really great. Yep, and that that glove there it lets you do this ledge grab. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. So Mallory just grabs the the edge of a you know uh, some kind of a ledge. So that's all I wanted to show you. Just a real quick um, taste of the game. It looked amazing. Oh well, thanks. And I want to let you guys know that if you go to my website, DylanWestAuthor.com. You can play that demo for free right on the web page. You don't even have to download and install any software. Just go there. If you have a USB controller like this, that's the easiest. I recommend that. But if okay. you don't, as long as you have a keyboard and mouse, you can play, you play the game. It. That is very cool. We actually do. Um, I we do link to it in the. Um, in the upcoming Motley Writers Guild blog post that we're writing about you specifically, as well as the release of Scribes Aflame. So for anyone watching this in the future, obviously, um, if you go to that blog post, that'll be linked in the description of this video. You'll be able to buy Dylan's book on Kindle. Um, you'll be able to go to his website, sign up for his newsletter, and follow him on all of his social medias as well. Yeah, the um, newsletter for, for me is going to help you not just know when books three through five come out of the Scribe series. Mm -hmm. It'll also give you updates on the progress of the game. Every month I'm adding some new feature, fixing bugs, whatever. And eventually that game will go out on Steam 
for okay. you to purchase the, the the full finished product. And so if you want to be notified when that game actually hits the market, you'll definitely want to subscribe so you, you find that out. And, and it's not just about like the game and stuff too, because of your background in technology, you're um, like, I am a newsletter subscriber of yours. Um, awesome. and, and I love the emails because they are so informative and so interesting and thought provoking. Oh, I think that that's always great to hear. <laughs> they're really great because it's called Pickle Jar Press. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And is that the name of that you're, um, you're releasing all of your, your written works under? Yes, that's my publishing company, and you'll always see the little logo in the on the spine and on the back cover. That's adorable. Um, and that that's because my my first name is Dylan, so my nickname is Pickle, and so Dill. Pickle Jar, Dill yeah, Pickle. Pickle Press. I got you. And, oh. and my wife actually hates the logo design uh, because not because she thinks it's ugly, but because she, as a foodie, she really wanted to see a pickle in the jar. Oh, was that a know, I tried. I tried really hard to prototype out different designs with a pickle in it, but any all those designs, none of them look good for some. I guess it looked too cluttered, too busy. So. I could see that. Oh darn it! I wish we could have made that work, but you know, um, graphic design and writing—you know—they're all complex and they don't always work out the way that you think that they will. Yeah. We do have about 10 minutes left to our um, our little interview here. Do you want to ask you a couple more questions if that's okay with you? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so pickles, obviously. Um, so what is your favorite food? Oh, I mean, probably steak. Like my favorite non-dessert food would be steak. Okay. Probably my favorite dessert would be um, ice cream. And it's What's a toss-up between chocolate and matcha green tea flavor. Oh, okay. Those might even taste good together. They probably would, actually. All right, um, I totally thought you were going to say pickles. You have sparked some fantasies up here. <laughs> and what was the last book that you read? So I read, a t I'm reading like multiple books at the same time. So uh, the answer is never just one book, but uh, the, the, the most recent one that was very memorable that I would kind of like to talk about is one by one, a, a fellow indie author, self-published author. Her name is Dawn Ross and we can provide the links and stuff um, yeah. in the, with the you other totally can, Yeah. But uh, this is called the book. It, it's a series. It's like a four or five book series. And uh, the book one is called Starfire Dragons. And it's a, like it's a space opera. Some people compare it to things like Star Trek, but really it felt very different for me. Didn't really seem like any book I'd read before, oh. um, which which is a good thing. Yeah. So there's this, the crew of a, a certain ship that happens upon a planet where there's people in distress. They're enemies, actually. They pick up two young boys and bring them on board. Uh, one of them is in a coma. The other one is awake. The one that's awake, his name is Jory. He um, he feels trapped. In fact, he feels like a prisoner on the ship because, you know, he's with his enemies. And they're all like middle-aged men. And he's a little boy. I think he's like 10 years old. And uh, But he's a really smart boy uh, and very well trained in martial arts and all this. And he wants to get away Everybody on the ship hates him except for one man named Commander Hapker. And this commander stands up for Jory um, to the whole rest of the crew. And he his job is to try to become friends with Jory and figure out how to get him home and, you know, to do it without uh, creating some conflict between their nation and the, this enemy nation. Um, with all that aside, that's not the part that I like. The thing that I like about this book is watching Jory and Commander Hapker interact. Because Aww, you've got this 10-year-old yeah. boy and this like 50-something-year-old commander, you know, this hardened soldier. And it's like they're in a crucible together. <laughs> you have to, they have to work things out. They have to get past these um, cultural differences and this enemy divide you know um 
and I'm definitely not giving it justice by my description, but I'm hoping that you'll go and try the book yourself, at least the yeah. first two chapters, and you know, see if you like it. I just felt like the the chemistry between those two characters was very special. I love um, that. Yeah. Is that your favorite genre? Is sci-fi kind of? It's a toss-up between sci-fi and fantasy. Okay. Mostly, I like the mixture of both, and that's Brain why my, my books <laughs> tend to be a mix of both. But I, I want the science fiction, I want most of the mechanics of how things are explained to be explained in terms of science, not magic. Yeah. But I want the elements of fantasy in there. Yeah, because that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. I love science fantasy. A fellow Motley Writers Guild member and I actually wrote two science fantasy novels together. So I am 100% on board with that because it marries the the best thing, I feel like, in, in my world, just science fiction and fantasy and just makes a peanut butter sandwich of awesomeness together. <laughs> <laughs> I like the world building of fantasy. Yeah. And I like the scientific rigor of hard science. Yeah. Well, that makes sense with your background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nuclear, you're, you're not going to operate a nuclear power plant unless you're pretty rigorous. <laughs> yes. And you're very good at taking notes. Or yeah, you're yeah. Homer Simpson, I guess. <laughs> oh, Famous Lord. nuclear power plant operator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so what is your favorite book of all time, if you have one? Well, I have to get specific, right? Um, if we're talking about my favorite book of any category, it would have to be the Holy Bible. But okay. if we're talking about novels that I did not write, I have to throw that stipulate. If it's yes. a novel I didn't not write, one you wrote yourself. <laughs> then, as far as sci-fi goes, I it would be a toss-up between Ender's Game and Old Man's War. Now, okay. Have you heard of Old Man's War by John Scalzi? I have not, but I have heard of Ender's Game. Okay, yeah, by Orson Scott Card. So yeah, those two. It's really hard for me to pick between those two for sci-fi. For fantasy. I think it would have to go to The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. Okay, Brandon that's Sanderson. The, yes. That's the book one of his really big Stormlight Archive series. Yes. And I, I've enjoyed all the books that he's released in that, all four that he's released so far. But book one is just, it's the probably the first novel that made me cry. Oh. So, and I'm not like, you know, one to cry, you know, for, for reading books. That but, makes one of us. <laughs> but uh the payoffs he he gave there were um were really impactful oh good well I, can i circle that back around to a question about your own writing um okay. have you ever written anything that that was really hard to write or that made you cry you know uh maybe in the sewer lord so okay. this in the Toward the end of book one, there is exactly one sentence that just casually refers to a novel in their universe called The Sewer Lord. Well, I actually wrote that, that book. <laughs> and no, uh, I, haven't, I haven't published it yet. I, I still need to finish revising it before that can go out. But there's a few parts of that that made me emotional. Oh, I love that. <laughs> And um and for your writing process, are you a panther, a plotter, a planter? You set me up for one of my most notorious jokes. You've already heard me say this, that in order for me, I, I can't even pants because I that would su suggest that I was actually wearing pants while I'm writing. You know, perish the thought. <laughs> if I'm if I'm still wearing pants, I'm doing something wrong, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's processes are different some people need to do a drunk on whiskey some people need to not wear pants we can't judge people for their processes as long as the um, art is wonderful but but i do massive note taking world building and i do a decent amount of outlining but i leave big enough holes in my outline that there is some room to pants so to speak yeah. um inside of each chapter awesome but I it's with how all this has to fit together and the complexity of it if i tried to do that as a pantser from start to finish it would probably not work very well at all probably not well dylan it was amazing getting to talk to you today i loved hearing more about the scribe birth 
Um, I, I really appreciate your time and letting our viewers know more about this. Um, I will be putting links to everything in the description as well as in that blog post. Is there anything you'd like to say before we, um, we bid our viewers adieu? Well, if you like big world building, you've come to the right place. I mean, I've even started making two new languages like Amazing. Tolkien did. Amazing. Um, You're an overachiever, Dylan. I love the I, uh, I made the font for one of them and installed it on my laptop and started typing in it in Microsoft Word. Just okay. saying. Um, if you're on the fence about my stuff, just go to the sample page for Scribes Descent and just start trying to read chapter one. Amazing. I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Dylan. You Thank you, Em. Thanks for having me. No problem.